Last week, when we looked at Psalm 33, we read these words that said, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Their starry host by the breath of his mouth. And we talked about the fact that he spoke creation into being. He didn't lift a finger when he was creating the world. Uh, he spoke it into being. That's why it says, by the word of his mouth, the heavens were made, and the starry host by the breath of his mouth. So all the stars that you see, he created them just by speaking the words. His word is that powerful. So we ask, in order to know how big the creator is, we have to under get a glimpse of how big the universe is. Because when we say he created the world, we know that it's not just Earth. In fact, Earth is a a very tiny little part of the universe that he created. So uh, we have a, a picture here of the galaxy in which we live. Scientists describe, they call this the, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, and this, this Milky Way galaxy uh, is just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that God created. But this is our neighborhood. This is where we live. You probably recognize it. Uh, you, I don't know if you can see yourself in there, but this is really designed to make you realize how small we are. Not only how small you are, but how small Earth itself is, because somewhere in the middle of that is our solar system. Uh, our solar system, which seems huge to us, the sun and, and all the planets and the moons and all these things that we focus upon, is, is just in, hidden in a little tiny uh, corner of that, and that's just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies in the known universe. Just to give you an idea of, um, uh, of where, where we are in this whole thing, I think if we go to the next slide, you see this is where you live, right here. See where it says this? So I think what you should do, next time people are coming to your house, send them this picture and say, I live right there. You know, if you hit Andromeda, you've gone too far. Turn around and come back, that's, that's where you are. So our solar system is right in that spot where that arrow is. In fact, they say, just to give you an idea of how small our solar system is, if the Milky Way galaxy was the size of the United States of America, our solar system would be the size of a quarter. That shows you how big the Milky Way galaxy is. In fact, if we go to the next slide, we'll give you some actual numbers here. They estimate that the Milky Way galaxy is 100,000 light years from one end to the next. So let's think about this. They don't measure the galaxy in terms of miles. That would do no good at all. So they measure it in light years. And a light year is how long it takes light to travel, how far light can travel in a year. Well, light is traveling at 186,000 miles per second. 186,000 miles per second. So how far does that light travel in one year if it's traveling at 186,000 miles per second? And however far that is, that's one light year. So if you wanted to get across our galaxy, just this one little galaxy out of the 100 billion other galaxies, and you started at one end, and you started traveling at 186,000 miles per second, and you did that for 100,000 years, you would get to the other side of our one galaxy. Is it stunning? Now, how many stars are in our galaxy? How many stars are there? We could count them real quickly here. But if you did, if you counted these one per second, if you went one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, and you started counting one star per second, it would take you 2,500 years to count these. That's that, and, and did you hear what we, we said here a minute ago? That by the breath of his mouth, the starry host were created. Not only that, Isaiah says in Isaiah chapter 40, listen to what, how he describes the stars. To whom will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes and look to the heavens. Who created these? He's saying, look at, look at the heavens and look at the, the starry host. This isn't the scripture here yet. I'm still on Isaiah. We're going to get to this in a second. And then he says, he who brings out the starry host one by one and calls forth each one by name. Now, remember how many we said are in our galaxy, which is only one of hundreds of billions of galaxies. If you count them one per second, it would take you 2,500 years. But the one who created them led them out one by one. Remember, he had, he had time. He had plenty of time. One by one. And he calls them each by name. How great is your God that he knows them by name? 
So when David writes Psalm 19, he begins by, this stay, by saying, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens, the skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they, for, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. So do you understand what he's saying? When you look up into the night sky, the sky is telling you about God without words, without sounds. Words are not necessary because what you see should be conveying this incredible message about how great your God is. So he says, they have no speech, they use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. Just looking at the universe tells us that. There was a, uh, a, a gentleman I saw, uh, somebody posted this online where they were saying, uh, he went up to a man who asked him if he believed in God. He said, I don't believe in God. He said, well, let me ask you three questions. He said, do you see that building over there? He said, do you think there was a, uh, do you think there was a builder who built that building, or did it just happen? And he goes, well, of course there was a builder. And he said, how do you know? And he goes, well, look, the design is perfect, and you can see how it's, you know, uh, it's, it's designed, so there has to be an architect and a builder. And he says, all right. So he says, uh, you pointed at, at a piece of artwork that was there outside there. And he says, do you see that artwork? He says, do you think there was an artist who did that? And he says, well, of course there was an artist. He goes, look how beautiful it is. And, and it was, you can see the, the work that went into it. it there was, had to be an artist. So he said, well, look at, this, look at this world. Look at this universe. Look at yourself. Do you think there was somebody who designed all of that? Or did that just come to be? You don't think that building just happened. You don't think that artwork just happened. So do you think you just happened? Do you think this universe just happened? Because this universe is far more impressive than the building or the artwork. And what David is saying about the universe, it is crying out to people every night, every day. There is a creator who put all this together. Look at the perfection of it. Look at the size of it. Somebody designed this. Somebody created it. And the message is going forth without words. The message is being shouted out to the world. And in the next section, he talks about how even the sun moves according to God's perfect design. He says, in the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like a bridegroom coming out of its chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run its course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. So every day when you see the sun rise and you watch the sun run its course until the sun sets in the other sky, know that that is happening perfectly according to God's design. So it's got, that's the warmth of the sun uh, warms every, everything under the, under the sun. This psalm changes after verse 6. In the first six verses... He's using a word for God that's a very general word. It's a, in, in Hebrew, it's just two letters, L. And it means God, but it's a very general word for God. But in verse 7, he changes to a new word for God. And now the word is, the word is Yahweh. And it's a very personal name for God. So it's, it's now going to be translated Lord. You see, in the first verses, we, it said, The heavens declare the glory of God. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent. That's L. But now we get to verse 7, and he says, the Lord, the law of the Lord is perfect. Now he's going to talk about God in a very personal way. What he's going to say is that this God who created all of the universe, who spoke it into being, who is greater than everything he created, he has chosen to make himself known to you. To you, who lives in that little corner of that galaxy of that's just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies, you live in that little tiny solar system on a little tiny planet, he made himself known to you, the God who created all of it. And that's why David loves God's word. So he, he starts in verse 7 saying, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. See, in, in nature in general, when the heavens declare the glory of God, we can know God in general from, the na from nature. It's called general revelation. God has made himself known, but only in the most general way. But through the Bible, it's called a special revelation. Because now, through his word to us, through the Bible, now we can know God in a very personal way. 
And there are personal things about God and about Jesus and about our salvation that we cannot see in the, in the universe, but we can read about in scriptures. So he, David, understanding how great God is who created the universe, has a greater appreciation for his word because he understands who it is who wrote it and how he has made himself known to little old David. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. I'm going to give you a little English lesson. I know you hate English and grammar, but I, I have to do it. There are five nouns that he just used, five nouns that describe various aspects of God's word. So he, he called it God's law, statutes, precepts, commands, ordinances. All of those words have a little different aspect, little different nuances of God's word. As you read through God's word, it is so it, it, there, there's so much variety there. There's, there's history and there's poetry and there's commands and there's just beautiful songs. Uh, wonderful, but it, it's all encompassed in God's word. David can't describe it in one word. He uses five different nouns to describe God's word. And then he uses five adjectives to describe how he feels about God's word. He calls it perfect, trustworthy, right, radiant, firm. It's a solid foundation. I'm not finished with the English lesson. There's six verbs. <laughs> There's six verbs to show what God's word does for you. And this is what God's word does for you if you read it. <laughs> okay? Reviving the soul. His word will give you new life. It revives your soul. It makes wise the simple. Gives joy to the heart. Gives light to to the eyes. It means it reveals truth. Enduring forever. That means it's still accurate today. It's still relevant today because it endures forever. It's altogether righteous. Everything about it is right. And then he goes on in verse 10 and talks about the great value of God's word, something that I think so few people understand today. They are more precious than gold. They are than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. Just one, one word about this. One reason that God's word is more precious than gold is that it tells us things about God that you cannot know without God's word. Like I said, you can look at creation and you can know a lot about God from creation, but you cannot know how to be saved. You cannot know about Jesus Christ. You can't know that it's in Christ alone that we are saved. And you can't know the plan of salvation uh, except through his word. So David knows that this word contains something that money cannot buy. Money can't buy salvation. Money can't give you the plan to be saved and give you that instruction. But God's word does. And that makes it more valuable than gold. It makes it sweeter than honey. But it does more than that. It also tells you how God wants you to live and how God doesn't want you to live. So it gives you warnings to avoid things that can trap you. In verse 11, he says, by them, meaning God's words, by them your servant is warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. But who can, dis who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. He said, who, who can forgive me? Who can, who can even tell when I'm getting off track? He says, keep your servant also from willful sins, for that, from willful sins, may they not rule over me. Because he knows that if you're not aware of what those sins are and you get involved in those things, they will enslave you. And we can look around our world today. We don't have to look very far at all to see people who are, who are slaves to sin people who are at, addicted to sin, and they are trapped by it, and they can't get set free. He, he's asking God's word to keep him from willful sins, that they may not rule over me, that I may be, that then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgression. That's what God's word can do, keep you 
innocent of that transgression because it, it warns you what path not to take. And he ends with this great benediction. He says, may the, these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. If God's word is that valuable, what should we do? There are people who hear God's word, and there are people who read God's word and study it. And there are people who meditate on God's word and, and memorize it. And to give you an idea of the difference of how all of that is, I want you to envision this little object lesson in which this hot water is your mind. This tea bag is God's word. And if you hear God's word, like you did today, and that's all, that's a good thing. You hear God's word, and it's like one dip of the tea bag in the, in the cup. Because you're exposed to God's word, and you, and you gain something from that. But if you go home, and you not just hear God's word, but now you read God's word, Every time you read God's word, it's like another dip of that bag in your life. It begins to color your thinking and color your, your thoughts. But when you memorize God's word and meditate on God's word, it's just allowing God's word, as, as Paul says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. You become steeped in God's word. And you just let it sit in there and dwell in you until it fills you and completely changes you and colors your thinking and, and changes the whole outlook you have on life. So David starts off by talking about how great God is. And because God is so great, his word must be the most valuable thing of all. Because that great God who created all of those things thought enough of you that he would make himself known to you by giving you his word. Can you imagine that most Christians have at least three or four Bibles sitting around their house and many of them go for days without ever being opened? And that comes from the God of the universe who spoke all of this into being. That word that is sitting on your shelf is able to, to make wise the simple and to bring joy to your souls and comfort to you, all the things that he said, and we leave it sitting on the shelf. And so some Christians say, well, I go to church every week and I hear it. Well, that's good. And others say, well, I pick it up every once in a while and I read it. That's good, too, because it, it's more and more. But when you let God's word dwell in you richly, it changes you. It changes you. It makes you into a different person, a whole new person. That's why it's more valuable than gold and sweeter than honey. So the next time that you walk outside at night and you look up at the stars, remember what you're looking at. You're looking at one little corner of that Milky Way galaxy, which is so vast in size we can't even comprehend it. And it's just one of hundreds of billions of galaxies that our Creator made. So every time you look at that, just remind yourself of how big God is, how great God is. And every time you open the Bible, remember who the author is. Remember that it's this God, the creator of the universe, who loved you so much that he sent you this as a personal letter so you can know him in a personal way. And don't just glance at it and put it away, but read it and study it and memorize it and meditate on it, that it'll change you, make you into the person that your creator intended you to be. Let's pray. Almighty God, our puny minds cannot even grasp how big you are. We can't grasp the size of your creation, much less the size of the creator who made all of it. Lord, we just praise you that you are a great and mighty God. And what's even more astounding is that you care about us. That not only do you call each star by name, but you know our names. You know every detail of our lives, every hair on our head, that you care about us. 
You care about us so much that you made yourself known to us through your word. Lord, I pray that this day the Holy Spirit will just fill us with a desire to know you, a desire to read your word and memorize it and meditate on it and let it dwell in us richly that we might know the creator of the universe, that we might know our own Savior. Lord, we praise you and thank you for this glorious gift in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the things, somebody took my tea.